This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Tommy McDonald. Tommy, how are you? I'm good. It's, uh, it's strange to be here. It's really strange to be the guest on a podcast instead of yeah. being the host. So a porn producer made pornos for over 10 years, over 300 pornos to a man now exposing the industry. It's, a, it's some shift that. Yeah, not not all of the industry, but just the bad bits. Like mm. um, Since I've been doing this, some people have been thinking I'm like an anti-porn person, but... I'm really not. Most people in the industry are good. I've had an incredible time in the industry. I love my friends. I love the experiences I've had. There's like a a real sense of family that you get in the porn industry um, that you don't get in other industries, I think. Yeah, because I'm friends with uh, porn stars, but they they call us the... What is it they call outside that porn? It's like a name she has for us. Uh, Civilians. Civilians, yeah, something like that. Some people hate that. yeah. Yeah. That's what it is, but it is. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Mm. Get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Wow. Um, honestly, I had probably an incredibly normal childhood. Um, just typical northern English lad, um, working class family. Um, Dad did all right, so we had a good life. Um, I guess I was socially awkward. I was always into music and things like that, and I think like most socially awkward people, you kind of become a bit obsessed with sex. You know, if you're not doing something, you're kind of always thinking about it, right? So I think I was always fascinated by sex. And then as I got older and started, um, you know, having more partners, it kind of did become a lifestyle. And so um, getting into porn was kind of a natural progression, I think. Um, When did you start watching porn? Watching? Oh, probably like... 12 or something whenever puberty hit strong you know yeah i used to watch the free view used to go in like what was it called free view bravo or something it was 10 minutes yeah Yeah. for me it was vhs Mm -hmm. a friend um had this vhs and we're like four of us like our parents went to the shops or something there's four of us sat around the tv not joking off or anything but just watching it and you know it was copied so many times like the tracking was off and but we were just mesmerized by Mm -hmm. it when did you lose your virginity uh, 16, 16, which I guess is, I don't know if it's early or it's average. A, it's about late. For me, I was 13. <laughs> At 16, I lost my virginity and I had a good relationship. And I thought, okay, I've worked girls out now. Like Time to expand. So I kind of broke up that relationship. Yeah. And I don't think I had sex again until I was 23. <laughs> it was... No way. Yeah, it was crazy. I was just fucking born again virgin. Yeah, pretty much. It was just, um, like I said, I was so socially awkward. I did not know how to talk to girls. I was like the kind of guy, if I go to a bar, I would, you know, just stay with my friends. I didn't, when I did say something, it was awkward and weird. And, you know, the only time I was like charismatic was when Mm. I was drunk enough to have confidence. But by then, you know, you're so drunk, no girl wants to be around you, you know. What about, like, were you fascinated fascinated with porn? Were you fascinated with porn and kind of... Were you looking at it as just because you were not having sex, where that was your form of 
building relationships? I don't know. I think it wasn't, I think, you know, like anyone that's not attractive um, to the opposite sex, you have to, like, you have to, I think some people will like blame the females, right? Like for rejecting them. But I think I was, you know, took it as, okay, I need to improve myself. So I was always reading about business, about improving your confidence, about just any self-improvement. I got into like a lot of self-help stuff, which I find a bit scammy now, but if it gives you that confidence to improve yourself, then it's a good thing, I think. Yeah, and of course, man. If you're lacking something, it's good to understand. Yeah. That. Yeah. And I think by the time I'd got to London, I had, I got a good job. I started to become self-confident myself, plus aging, you know, I'm a skinny, um, dorky lad is not so attractive but as you kind of grow into yourself i think you naturally become more attractive as you age as a man what and job I, did you do um at first i was in the gambling industry and then i moved into media um i was like an editor publisher of um like trade magazines what gambling industry yeah um, what did you do at first i was just literally just working in a gambling shop and in the bookies hometown. yeah and the bookies and then um I moved to like the head office and like, my plan was to try and like get into trading because that was, that looked fun, mm. but I never got that far. I was always quite entrepreneurial and I remember making some software that basically did my job for me, but it was really hard to sell because how do you sell it to a department that employs 40 people? Like you don't, you genuinely don't want to do yourself out of the job. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was fun. How long did you do that for? Um, Probably about three or four years, but I'd say I spent more time working in media. Um, and I think that gave me the skills to get into porn because, you know, working in newspapers and magazines, it's just content. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're making content, we're learning how to monetize the content. And the fact it was, you know, some boring magazine about packaging or printing or, you know, IT or something like that, porn is just different content. So, when I got into porn originally, I thought this is just a more fun version of my own job. Uh, I thought it was going to be lucrative. You know, I thought porn was a very rich industry, but it turned out it's actually quite a poor industry. What made you go into porn? Was it the excitement for the women or the sex, or did you see a business I think drama? More business, yeah. You know, I think films like Boogie Nights influenced me. Um, it looked lucrative. It looked, you know, like party. I just thought it'd be lots of parties, lots of drugs, lots of, you know, girls around all the time. But the reality of running any website is you're sat in the office doing nerdy stuff like SEO, which worked well for me because mm -hmm. um, I happen to be good at that stuff. What was the first porno you done? Literally, um, it took a long time to get started, but I actually advertised on the internet for, um, like a business partner. So I was advertising for someone to go 50-50, uh, a female, obviously. And we literally just started. Uh, we struck up a friendship and we just started you know, making homemade sex tapes. And it was supposed to be a side business, but it was making so much money so quickly that it became the main one. I had to give up my other business. How was it making money? Is it monetization, sponsors? How does it work? Yeah, if you imagine it, it was like we were making very homemade videos before OnlyFans existed. So I think most porn companies were making very professional, very slickly produced kind of fake looking porn videos in ours, partly because we had no idea what we we're doing and partly um, out of laziness, maybe, I don't know. Um, they just looked real. And I think people liked that. Um, and it was just subscriptions. We we're just like charging $25 a month for, you know, all you can eat membership. And it just kept growing. What's, how did you get the people to do the scenes? We, it was just us two at the beginning. So we so didn't need people. Them? Yeah, it was just. So just, you're a porn star as well? I'm not a porn star because I was holding the camera. Okay, my face is visible sometimes, but it was more like POV, you know. Mm -hmm. like sometimes the camera would be like on the side of the bed or something like that. But So your face was it or not? Sometimes it was. I don't think people are watching porn for the man's face. So, you know, if it's in there, that's fine. But, you know, the focus is all on the woman at least on the genre I was doing. So you start off kind of behind the scenes making pornos, but then you end up making 300 and within... Oh, probably more, 10, yeah. 10 years. So what's the steps to then become a successful porn producer? Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if you remember... Like, we, we didn't know. Like, there was no manual. Most people that go into the industry, they start as performers. 
or start as like a cameraman or lighting guy or something like that. And then you work your way up to producing. But with us, we started as independent, just like a, a couple, but we were not together, uh, just friends. And we're making money, but we had to kind of teach ourselves. So when we realized like, okay, we need to get other people on the site, not just us, um, we didn't even know how to book models. We didn't know porn model agencies existed. So first we were like messaging cam girls and things like that. Um, but they're not porn stars, they're different. So, but eventually we found model agencies in Budapest uh, and uh, I moved there. Uh, we both moved there in the end. And that's when things really opened up and we felt part of the porn industry properly. Instead of just two independent people doing our own thing. Once we moved there, it was like, okay, we're part of something now. And we started to get nominated for awards and things like that. And, you know, it's a very small industry worldwide. So everybody kind of knows each other. What's the biggest porno you made? Um, it doesn't really work like that on, on our sites because it's just one website mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you join it and that's it. So it wasn't like, you know, I guess it was just at the start of that time when DVDs were dying. Can anybody use your content and put it on other sites? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of piracy, but piracy is kind of good for business. Um, you know, someone that's searching for free porn is probably not going to pay anyway. So it's just exposure, right? What's but, the biggest sex scene you've done? Um, honestly, ours was quite vanilla. Um, just too shagging? Yeah, sometimes it'd be threesomes and things, but there's so much effort to, because, you know, it's like porn sex, you're not necessarily into each other. So if it's just you and one girl, it's quite easy to fake chemistry. But when there's two girls to direct, it's hard to manage. Like um, in porn, we call them like a dick dodger. Like one girl will let the other one do all the work and she'll just like stand to the side, like smiling, you know. Um, so you have to, the more people you have, the more cuts there are, the more like direction you have to give people. Um, it gets tricky and in the end, our brand was, we were aiming it more at geeks because we did um, like some cosplay. We, I mean, our site was a bit weird. We did like movie reviews and things like that. We tried to make it more of a lifestyle thing um, just with porn. So a bit like Playboy was um, back in the day, um, only we were appealing more to like geek culture, like things we were into. Is that because of yourself? Both of us, I'd say. Um, we Did you see the market because that's the way you were? I, I think we just knew we had to blog, for example, to get traffic. Um, so for to get search traffic, we just had to blog a lot. So we just blogged about the things we knew about. Um, for my business partner, that was um, things like, um, you know, anime and manga and things like that. Uh, for me, I had that kind of more self-help interest. Um, we just tried to share that. Um, just sex tips. Um, dating strategies, anything like that. Because, you know, once you've, you know, jerked off, you're probably not going to watch porn anymore, but there's stuff for them to read as well. Um, so it was a very vanilla site. Um, we, I'd say our audience was very young, um, not particularly an ex experienced. And there's another aspect is that at the time, the UK government was pushing these kind of anti-porn measures. I don't know if you remember them, but... Oh they started fining porn producers that were doing extreme acts. It was things like spanking, strangulation, um, anything seen as violent towards women. They were fining them, like I think it was 2000 euros and threatening to block their site. Um, and at the time we kind of were really against it. I think there's even media coverage of us being against it. I think there was a porn stars like doing a spanking protest outside parliament and things like that. But I think the intention behind that was right, but it it's, you know, trampling on free speech mm -hmm. and on people's jobs. What does it take to make a porno? Just a camera, just a phone. Is that that? Yeah. Is it much directing? Or, because I've interviewed porn, porn stars and they'd say it can be hours, you can be there all day, mm -hmm. 12 hours, 16 hours, certain shots. First of all, they do the... The shots first, they'll get the camera angles first with the photos, mm -hmm. and then they'll get into whatever scenes they're doing. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of unnecessary stuff. It depends on the porn production. And like some are more artistic than others. Um, 
some do things a certain way because they always have. So the typical way when I first started was you would do the pictures because before Pornhub, you advertised your scenes on sites called um, like thumbnail gallery posts. So it was just like a collection of free porn, but pictures, and then you joined the website for the video. So you do the pictures for that. You would do a softcore version for a TVX and um, you know, the TV channels, they can't show penises, can't show vaginas, so softcore version. And then you do the hard version as well. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's James20 for 20% off. Plus, you know, you've got to wait for makeup to be done, lights to be set up. You might have different lights for photos, different. But a lot of these long days are simply because of disorganization. Like, there's no need to keep someone for 16 hours. Um, in some cases, it might even be a deliberate strategy to make girls tired and exhausted so they say yes to things more easily. Not 100% sure of that, but it's a suspicion because... You know, there's, you're not going to film more than two hours of fucking. It's just, yeah. there's no need. Did any of the guys take anything for erections, Viagra oh, injections? This is a bit of a campaign of mine. I hate this so much. Um, there, there's a lot of pressure on the men to inject their penis with, um, there's different drugs. I think the most common ones is Trimix or Cavaject. Um, but it's like a form of Viagra. Um, you inject it with one drug to make yourself go up and you inject it again to make it go down and the truth is that if you remember porn back in the day most of the guys were ugly as hell because there were not many people in the world that could get an erection on camera in front of lots of people with pressure with any girl no matter what she looked like and stay hard that whole time um, including between takes um, and get up again when you need to um, and then the hardest part is often, you know, coming on command. Like when it's time to come, you need to come. You can't be like waiting around 15 minutes to, to finish. And there were not many guys in the world that could do that. But with the injection, anyone can be a porn star. Like um, maybe not anyone, but like if you inject it with this drug, it's going up. The problem is it's incredibly dangerous. So many men in the industry are having, um, they call it like a heart attack of your dick. Basically, the blood stops flowing and the penis will go black and you have to be taken to the emergency room uh, like, because the doctors have to like drain the blood, almost like save the penis. Um, it's incredibly dangerous. And obviously, they're obtaining these drugs without a prescription, um, which and no porn production is the porn productions. If you speak to them, they'll say, oh, we're, we're not encouraging this, but they are. Um, it's unspoken, but if you're a guy that injects, you get more work because you're easier to work with. We don't have to be nice to you. We, you know, you can, we can treat the men like shit and they still get hard and do their job. Mm -hmm. So it's just, all they want is to do the scene as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, another downside of that is these guys, they can't feel any, anything in their dick. So like they can thrust a lot harder without hurting themselves, which obviously hurts the girls more. Um, the hardness from an injected dick, it's a lot stiffer and it can just be uncomfortable for the girls, you know? So there's a lot of downsides to it. I think for me, the biggest problem is the health of the men. Uh, there's quite a few guys. Some have had to have surgeries to have a pump put into their penis. So they literally pump it up with a saline solution that makes their dick hard and puts it down again. Many guys can't even have an orgasm. Um, they are not on camera, so they're injecting their penis with, uh, I think it's a mixture of like some sort of baking soda uh, and then just doing a fake cum shot because that they can't come on camera. Um, but it, I, I wonder about these guys if they, in their private life, how do they fuck? Because, you know, they're destroying their penises, they're destroying their sex drive, they're destroying their sexuality just so they can be on camera and be this hero you know it's not a great deal of money as a male performer but when you're going through that did you see the destruction there or were you just thinking about business and making money 
I was right at the beginning of the injection becoming common. So for me, it was a shock. Um, but the porn I'm doing, it's like, you know, just me, um, the girl, maybe one other person watching. It's very easy when there's maybe six people around watching. It's a lot harder. Right? And plus, I'm in control of the porn shoot. So, you know, we can chill, we can have coffees, we can relax, get to know each other. Um, on other sets, it's more just like, okay, let's do it. Um, so it's, and at the time, I saw it was getting more popular, the injection. And now, I, just even the guys that didn't inject before, they do now because they have to compete. How many, how many porn stars did you work with? Um, I would only book guys that didn't inject. Um, so not many. Um, I had like um, a close friend, um, really good guy. Uh, whenever I need a guy, I always use him. Um, when I've had to use others, they don't know your style. You have to teach them. So I prefer to work with the same person all the time. Mm -hmm. Because obviously with you exposing the porn industry and the darkness and some of the mm. fields in it, do you ever feel like a target or a hypocrite that people say, well, you've done it? So people might not believe you as much? Um, I don't know. I, I, I've, uh, some people in the porn industry have been trying to kind of discredit me. Like, oh, he's not really in porn. It's like, well, I am. I was, you know, my company was nominated for awards most years or won awards. So, um, you know, we're doing something right. We know a lot of people. I, I don't think we're just... So th that, that's how they try to discredit me. I think people are quite surprised to see me speaking out because like one i'm male and two i'm in the business a lot of people have spoken out about the porn industry before but they tend to be um girls who have quit um and usually they found god as well so they usually become very christian and kind of reject the porn industry afterwards mm -hmm. because i've got friends porn stars only fans love it I yeah. see the sadness in their eyes, though I'm not daft. I feel the energy towards them. And I know the destruction it is causing, no matter how much money they make. I also have people who's was in the porn industry, successful porn stars, and absolutely despise it, speak out about it, about the abuse, about the rapes, about everything. And mm. it's crazy to see the both ends. Like, I'm not in the porn industry. I can only let people who love it talk about how much they make. And, and then I can also let people on who despise it and try and expose it mm. that's why it's good to just have both sides because when i say somebody's exposing the porn industry you'll see porn stars the porn industry is good and mm -hmm. it's this and it's safe and i've never came across any of that just because you ain't came across that doesn't mean nobody else has yeah to say that as well they're protecting someone because so. everybody's seen something bad yeah and, and you know um yeah like everybody's seen something bad everyone it's a very small industry so if you haven't sat there while one of your friends is in tears over something that's happened to them then like i don't know how you can be in the industry and that not happen unless you're like particularly anti-social and no one's going to open up to you um but you know it's a very tight-knit industry everybody knows each other or knows you know friends of friends do you think because the girls are porn stars that it's that an easier target to be abused um it's a good question i i don't know i feel and like i say for me most of the industry is good i think where the porn industry has a problem when there is an abuser we protect them and i know that because i've done it um when the allegations came out about Ron Jeremy, about James Dean. I was saying the same kind of victim blaming things like, well, they didn't go to the police, so it can't have happened. Um, or like, yeah, but you know, he's a really nice guy. He's been nice to me. So I can't imagine him being bad to someone else. Um, so I've been guilty of it. To uh, try and protect your own industry? Protect your friends, protect your Who industry. Your friend? Um, what like a, James Dean and um, Ron Jeremy, for example. Who's I, James Dean? He was a, had a big Me Too scandal in America. I know um, Ron Jeremy. He was fucking... He was yeah, poison man as well. He, he was very I, kind to us. And, you know, we saw people lining up to be groped by him. So we justified it that way. Um, like, look, people are lining up to grope him. So he, like, that's his thing. If you're lining up, you're going to get groped because... That's why you're in the line. But, you know, and that made us kind of not even 
be curious about the stories out there from girls that said they raped he raped them um so i think we all do that like when it's not just people in the pornos who do that it's it's mothers and fathers do it you know when um a child's been abused you don't believe that your partner could abuse your child and you don't believe that the person you love most in the world could abuse the other person you love most in the world so that's an extreme case but if a mother won't believe that her husband or c- can abuse their child then in porn where we're not even that close not as close as that relationship um you know how do you believe it it's really hard to believe women that speak out so ron jeremy girls used to queue up for him to abuse them um yeah like the fa- the the fan events like um there'd be a line two or three hours long of girls and guys waiting for like ron to like sign their boobs and he would grope them squeeze them whatever like suck them anything like he was and he would be sat there in like jogging bottoms uh with like food stains all over him he really was this just slob just a sleazy slob um that was the character he was playing but that was really him he didn't care you know and you know everyone knew you know go no ron you get squeezed um but we all accepted it as like this fun personality trait I mean he did create that but you know looking back you have to think was that did that just become like a cover for the bad things he allegedly did yeah that's a bad that seems like like you says is a cover up where he's the porn star and people are saying about he's grabbing them but that's then sexual mm. abuse absolutely it, it, it's especially if someone's lining up to do it yes but then he was like groping everybody he came across you know and there were videos posted online um but by a girl that I can't remember the girl that exposed him in in, in the first place but how many charges did he get um there were over 30 i believe going back from when do you know from the 80s i think yeah so it's not a case he's been in that industry and he's been so damaged by it and it's been so normalized that girls letting them fucking grope him i i, I suspect that yeah. abuse has been um embedded within the porn industry for a long time and it's only the me too movement that removed that um i i've heard many stories from the older guys in in porn that it was just kind of expected that models have to do sexual favors for directors and producers and owners and the you know the overlap between porn and prostitution it, it that also causes a lot of you know strange things to happen let's say especially in america where prostitution is illegal um there's a big case at the moment with a british producer i so he was a british performer and then started an agency uh derek hay i don't know if you've come across him mm-hmm. he's been charged with uh pimping and pandering um and what he was allegedly doing is he was had the agency for the porn stars and then he was um just be careful what i say um he was allegedly starving them of porn work because when you book a porn model the agent only gets a hundred dollar fee but if she's escorting she's charging like three thousand dollars an hour in america and he gets 30 percent. so it's a huge difference so apparently allegedly he was denying them work in porn making them need money and then pushing them towards the escort agency what's the difference let me some daft question but for people but what's the difference from prostitution and porn they're both getting paid to fuck um i think the difference is with prostitution you're there to please the man you know you were the product whereas with porn you're making a video but you're there to please you know the camera it's there is an overlap definitely especially with um only fans in the days of only fans there's definitely guys that are doing prostitution as a hobby you know and sharing the videos on their only fans they're not making money they're just funding it from their day job but you know is that a failed porn business or is it a hobby i don't know so there's a gray area in the middle but yeah. i'd say the difference is 
Um, and you know, not every porn star wants to be a prostitute and not every prostitute wants to be a porn star, but there are some that like and are happy to do both. And before OnlyFans, that was how you made your money. You would do porn to get famous and then prostitution to, um, to, to, to just make a bucket load of cash. Mm-hmm. It's mad to think how, because it's all the usual suspects from stripping to escorting to porn. It's all kind of under the same sex, umbrella. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see the difference from people who's in the industry a long time? The, the kind of, not demise of them, but the, like a tired some just kind of, you see wear and tear in them? No. You don't see actually, that? No, I see, I, I think everyone has like a type of sex work they're comfortable with. Everyone that's a sex worker is like, you know, some people, like I think porn is maybe the most extreme type of sex work. Um, maybe escorting next because you maintain some privacy. Like it's the whole world doesn't know you do it. So if you stop, and it's traumatic for you, your trauma ends and you can start working on yourself. Whereas with porn, if you regret doing it, you've got to relive your trauma every time you see a video or someone reminds you of it, you know, for the rest of your life. So I think porn's the most extreme and then, you know, escorting because of the danger of meeting people, um, when you know, a webcam, Mm -hmm. um, similar to porn, but it's more tame you're not doing anything. You know, people are not going to be as judgmental about a girl masturbating on the internet as they are about a girl being fucked on the internet. Because they've got a casting couch in America that they talk about for the actors and actresses. But for somebody who's going for a job as a stripper, mm-hmm. the manager will say, we'll strip. Show me what you've got. So for porn, where do you where do you separate from, okay, if you want to be a porn star, I've never really seen you do it. Where's the fine line of manipulation and trafficking? We um, say, well, oh, how do I know if you're good? Casting for porn is pictures. Send me pictures and video because that's what's important. Um, if the agent tries to have sex with the girl, that's grossly just wrong, just incredibly wrong. Uh, it does happen. Um, it really does happen, um, especially in Europe. Um, but I think it's more fake model agencies um, will do that to people. There's a lot of fake model agencies that are just a guy scamming girls into having sex. Yeah, because I, I says that, the girl who was uh, Charlotte Kirk, who was exposing kind of Hollywood, she had the big court case and stuff. But girls who are willing to sleep with whoever it is to get to the levels they've got and the men doing it. Where's the, where's the, who who's that go against then? Where's the line for that? Do you know what I mean? If somebody's saying, well, I want to be massive in the porn industry. I mm-hmm. want to sleep with whoever I want. I want to sleep with all the big names so I can move up the ladder. And they guys are quite willing to do that as well. Yeah, like sleeping with people won't make your name bigger in porn. Um, like the thing that makes you big in porn is your social media. Like nothing else matters really. Um, can some porn companies help with that? Help with your fame? Yeah, not many of them, but not many of them have that power. Um, will they pretend that they'll be good for your career? Yes, they will. Um, so it's tricky, but there's no one you can sleep with that will help your career in porn. It's not like Hollywood where you can sleep with someone or in the music industry, even where you can sleep with someone and that can open up a door and a new opportunity for you because like no one, like it's hard to find models to have sex on camera. So, so long as they like your look or so long as you've got a lot of social media followers, they're going to shoot you. Like nothing, no, per, no, they're not going to go, oh, I'm going to shoot you because this guy says you're a great person. No, it's really easy to get a scene. You're just like, yeah, I'd like to work for you. Here's my fee. Do you, do you want to shoot me? Like, no one, there's no way of getting extra work. Like so how that. do you end up shooting hundreds of pornos, working with porn stars all around the world to then speaking out against that, the industry, something that you've worked on, something that you love, something yeah. you've made money from? Where's the, how does that come about? What was the moment? It was, um, I started a podcast. Um, I, I started, like I said, I'm a very socially awkward guy. And um, in lockdown, I tried to like boost my confidence, just posting pictures to Instagram. And at some point I started talking and it eventually developed into a podcast. Um, a podcast about, you know, just for men, just to help men like me that maybe struggled with 
you know, getting girls, uh, understanding sex, uh, having good relationships. Um, and the way I was doing that was just interviewing porn stars because that's who I knew. That's the celebrities that I had access to in Europe. Um, and we were doing an episode about rough sex um, because it's always been interesting to me. I've heard a lot of girls complain that when they have sex with a guy in their private life, he'll often be really rough with them and hurt them and just do things that they didn't expect and they didn't ask for. Um, so we thought, let's try and you know help guys, like teach them about consent and all this stuff. And on the podcast, Nellie Kent, who's a porn star, she um, told us about how violent Rocco Sifredi is. Uh, if you don't know, Rocco Sifredi is one of the most famous porn actors of the last 30 years. He's Italian. He's a genuine celebrity in Italy uh, and maybe the biggest producer in Budapest where I live. Um, and she told me about the violence. Um, and I even asked her on the show, you know, why is no one else speaking out about this? And she said, because I'm the only one that's brave enough. Um, everybody else, they, you know, depend on other people for money. They're worried about their careers, but I'm independent. So, you know, I'm the only brave one. And then after that show came out, it started to go viral on TikTok and things like that. She freaked out, like absolutely freaked. And she called me and she was saying, you know, everybody's getting on to her. She's, you know, she's just begging me to remove the podcast, basically. And Rocco Sifredi and also a model agency called Brill Babes who were not her agent, they used to be her agent years ago. They'd both been contacting the girl. I don't know what they said to her, but she felt threatened enough to want to remove the podcast. And when I spoke to Rocco and to the agent, um, they were stupid and they left in the screenshots that they'd sent me. I could see that they'd got this agent to act like a bottom bitch, basically, in pimp terminology, like an enforcer of the girl that did not work for them. And remember, a model agent should work for the model. Like, why would they be... So when a model speaks out about a producer, the model should be on the performer's side, right? Helping her, like, oh my God, really? Like, how do we stop this? Should we still send girls to him? But no, she was silencing the model. And I've been living in Budapest, the same city as Rocco, um, the same city as Pierre Woodman. And I've heard so many bad stories about them directly from girls. And I never spoke out about it. I said the responsibility was the girls. I say, I was always complain. I say, you know, European girls are so weak. They're so cowardly. The American girls, when they have a problem, they speak out on Twitter and they get it stopped. Um, and you know, why don't the European girls speak out? But once they did speak out on my podcast, I saw that they get silenced. Um, I've also got a witness that witnessed um, Nelly being very scared. At a Christ it was like around Christmas time. So she was said um, that they were all at this Christmas party and this girl was basically paraded in front of everybody, um, apologizing like crazy to Rocco, um, apologizing to this agent um, and just looking scared. And they thought it was like to make an example of her in front of all the girls in the business. You know, if you speak out, this is going to be you. How much abuse goes on in the porn industry? Um, a lot of abuse by not many people. Um, I think that's the best way of describing it. Because no, but when you, if you're a girl that joins the porn industry, usually you're young, like 18 to 21. And there's no onboarding process. The way you get introduced is either um, a production starts you or more likely an agent starts you. And the agent should be telling you things to watch out for, how to be safe, all of this stuff. But in Europe, it's not really like that. Um, they're more concerned with, I think they get kickbacks from producers because everyone wants to have a girl's first scene. And new girls are naive and they're more easily manipulated, more easily bullied, more easily threatened into doing things they would never normally say yes to. And this is the thing 
I saw with Rocco um, at the beginning. So when Nelly was silenced, I thought, like, shit. Um, if there was like a just a paradigm shift for me, um, I just felt so bad because I'd blamed the girls for not speaking out, and I could have spoken out eight years ago, but I just thought it was their responsibility. But once she was silenced, I felt I had to. So I thought, okay, let's dig around the internet. Let's see what I find. And in five minutes, I found videos of what can only be described as Rocco Sofredi raping girls. Um, and that's my expert opinion as a porn producer, because, you know, he's the videos. Are, I don't know if you saw the videos I sent you, but they're, they're so disturbing. Um, no, I saw the links on Twitter, but it looks as if you were watching an iPad. Uh, yeah, I was watching my iPod. I was like reacting to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I made them into a cartoon just to try and tone them down a bit, but I couldn't put them on YouTube. And like the girls are saying, he's what he's doing is he's asking for anal sex in the middle of the scene. And that's not what you do because everything should be planned beforehand, like days before, so that the girl can decide for herself, do I want to do this? Yes or no? Asking her on the day when you're, I mean, he's a celebrity, he's a powerful figure, he's a powerful figure in the industry. Like, yeah, I don't know what that was. It's, um, like, imagine, imagine how it feels to be, it's an incredibly intimidated atmosphere. And then you're being pushed into anal sex. He says, oh, I want, I want to have anal sex with you. The girl says, no. So that should be it, right? It's her decision. And then it's not that, it's constant pressure. So it's definitely coercion in that sense. And then when the girls are saying no, he's fucking their ass anyway. And so he's forcing it upon them. In one of the videos, for example, the girl's saying, stop, stop, it hurts. And he just says, but I like it. And these are videos that Rocco is not an independent producer like I am. He produces independently, but then his films are distributed by the biggest porn company in the world. Um, a lot of people think um, MindGeek, who own Pornhub, are the biggest porn company in the world. But for actual professional productions, it's Gamma Entertainment. They're also based in Montreal, Canada, the same as Pornhub. But they were, like, the biggest porn company in the world were watching videos of girls being raped and putting them on their website and selling them. Um, and that's an incredible thing because you just, I just didn't expect that. I'd been in the industry for so long, but I don't, I guess because I'm making porn, I don't watch porn so much anymore. But, and it's not a small number of people, it's millions of people watching girls being completely traumatized. Um, the trauma that girls experience when they are subject to something like this is life changing, um, completely life changing. Uh, one of the girls that was a obvious victim, uh, she took her own life. I don't know if she took her life because of the trauma she experienced in porn, um, but I wouldn't surprise me if it, if that was the case. Yeah, I was speaking to a woman who's coming on actually in a couple of months. She's got a book coming out, but she exposes Pornhub. Is that There's Patricia? Uh, American woman. Ah, uh, no. No, so she's exposing Pornhub. And she's just talking about the underage sex that's on it, the rape mm -hmm. that's on it. Oh, Layla, maybe. Layla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, they've been helping me, actually. Yeah, so she was coming on, but she says she's got a book coming out, so she'll come on end of the year. And I just see her posts on Twitter, man. Yeah. And I'm thinking... Her work is incredible. Dark, man, but... Yeah. Why does the porn sites allow this? Why is underage sex allowed? Why is the rape allowed? Why is the abuse allowed? Because they say over 80% mm -hmm. of porn on the internet is abuse. I don't, I, I, they say, I think that stat is, um, violent, but it depends how you define violent, right? Mm. If something's consensual, like people get rough with sex in their private life, but when the roughness is wanted and boundaries are set, it's fine. It's fun. You know, you explore whatever kink or craziness you want, so long as, you know, you both want to do it. But in porn, you're not doing it because you want to do it. You're doing it because you're being paid to do it. Um, and if someone crosses your boundary, like that's just 
flat out abuse. Um, it, it's and there's no need for it. This is the thing we forget. Um, I call Rocco's porn domestic abuse porn because that's what it is. It's just domestic violence. Um, it the girl's not enjoying it. She doesn't want it. She's just tolerating as much as she can in trying to get through the scene because she wants to have a porn career. And in Europe, it's not like it is in the UK or America. In Europe, if you do one porn video, any other career you want to have is gone. You can't even, I have a friend that um, she just works in a beauticians and she lost her job because she was posting sexy photos to Instagram, not porn, but just bikini pictures. Like it's that conservative. So, you know, once they've done a few porn videos, they've got to kind of survive. And, you know, they, they at the beginning, they will be abused do you think by one, certain people. Do you think once or then it's difficult to get out? Because I had a police officer on who used to share bikini photos and they sacked her as well. There's mm. a lot of bullying going on. Do you feel as if because they're so in it, they can't really go anywhere else? But listen, in but life, it, you can't go anywhere yeah. else. You do have choices, but... Do you feel as if that's the conditioning that happens when you go in that industry? There's definitely a lot of conditioning. Um, in Europe, the biggest pool of models comes from Russia and the Ukraine. And in my opinion, that's pure sex trafficking. Um, those girls are like porn production is illegal in those countries, like highly illegal. The only people who are making it is organized criminals. Um, and they are getting as much, what they do is they like, they pay girls almost nothing, like a hundred euros a scene for like gangbangs and things like that in Russia, get as much out of them. And they sell the videos to European productions. In some of the videos, it's obvious girls are being raped um, or even high on drugs, all sorts of things. Like personally, I don't think any porn produced in Russia or Ukraine should be legal because it's illegal to make it there. So by definition, it's illegal content. And the girls, you can't guarantee their safety when criminals are making content. Um, but I don't know, because it's Russia, no one seems to care. It's like, you know, who's caring about these Russian girls? And then the European porn industry, like once, once they've kind of broken them in over there, they send them to Europe. Um, on fake, that uh, they apply for tourist visas, and then they stay indefinitely. What they, I won't say what they do now because um, I, there's, I'm speaking to authorities about it, but what they used to do is they would uh, have access to a lawyer that would put fake visa stamps in their passport so that they could stay in Europe. They would just overstay their visa. And then after the three months was up, they would send their passport to Russia, fake stamp from immigration, post it back and it looks like they've re-entered and okay these girls are from very poor places in Siberia they don't have many opportunities and you know being abused by the porn industry in Europe it's not that bad for them in many ways or they don't think it's that bad at the time um you know I always used to justify it as oh they're here for a better life you know how does that make you feel when you knew what was going on eight years ago and you never says anything do you regret that it's destroyed me to be honest um i just i didn't follow the logic of the information i knew i knew the girls were illegal immigrants but i didn't think oh what control does the agent have over them or how do they say no to someone on a porn set when they're career and life in Europe can be taken away at any time you know because how do I how do they know a producer's not gonna call immigration on them because they said no um and I feel horrible for it at one point I made jokes about it there was a Russian yoga cult and they were supplying most of the hottest girls in European porn and we were all making loads of money from these girls like they were crazy hot they were had like perfect gym bodies. And this one guy in Russia, he made, he would train them and give them a diet and make them look hot and then pimp them out all over Europe in prostitution and in porn. And we found it funny because they were in a cult and we just thought this guy was a legend. None of us 
ask the girls about their welfare. None of us. But were you yeah. so caught up in that? Yeah, just the lot. I, we were making a lot of money, and it's. Is that where you block out all the madness? I think so. Because I, it's still a human being. It's still human. Yeah. Being. At and the time, I was, I was a. I don't like to say alcoholic because I wasn't diagnosed, but I had a drinking problem. And I lived a very selfish life. I didn't ask questions. Just, I just didn't. But now I realize like the suffering they went through. Because you were part of their suffering. I was part of the suffering. And is that why you're trying to do the right thing now? I could be part of it. Um, definitely nearly triggered something. Um, just seeing her silenced and because it was my show, I felt I had to, to keep going really. How bad is it? And are you talking about it? Because I've had porn stars on who love it. I don't see that stuff for the same the comments and I love this industry and how are they British. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they won't see it. Um, they, the British girls get special treatment by the European agencies because they're afraid of them because they know the British girls can speak out. Um, West European girls, they will see abuse. Absolutely. They, they will see abuse and no, but they won't see the severe abuse that the Russian and Ukrainian girls are subject to. How bad is it for those girls? It's horrendous. Um, if we move on to like Pierre Woodman, for example. Who's he? He's probably the second most famous producer in Budapest. Um, he's a much darker character. Um, he, like in, uh, when I was exposing Rocco, I found uh, a girl called Eva Berger and she was calling out Rocco in Russian media. Um, so I just shared it, but she was also calling out Pierre Woodman. And long story short, she came on the podcast for an interview and went through it. And it was so emotional, even for me, just to talk to her about it. Um, we sat and we watched the video of what happened to her. And it was harrowing, um, just watching how upset she was. It took us nine hours to record the podcast because it was just so difficult to get through. It was so, it was like, it's like a sickness in your stomach, you know, and, and I'm not the victim. Like those kind of things they were doing to her were um, kicking her in the breasts, kicking her in the ass. Um, at one point they suffocated her with a pillow. Um, they were fucking her ass with two penises in the ass um, at the same time and she was bleeding and they just carried on. Um, and the background to that, and this is the way Woodman operates, is he uses agents as like a bottom bitch to do the bad stuff, to condition them. Now he would claim, or he claims that, you know, so the girls get sent to him for just an interview just a casting, a paid interview. So they pay like 50 euros, 60 euros, something like this. And the girls genuinely think it's just an interview or just a casting. And then on the day, he's got, obviously, he pushes them and pushes and pushes them to do everything he wants, to do something ex incredibly extreme, often a gangbang, often double anal, double penetration. And if you look at a lot of girls on his site, They'll have only done anal or only done double penetration with him. Um, and that's because the agent is conditioning them by withholding any information about the shoot until the day. And you can't, like, um, imagine any other type of work where you don't know what the job is until you get there. It's like, I don't know if you, when I was young, I remember going, I wanted a job in sales because I thought that's a good way to make money. And I would go to these interviews and then I'd find out on the day it's door to door. And you know, if I didn't, if I knew it was door to door, I would have said no. And then they're trying to sell you really hard on the job. Um, and it's like that only it's sexual assault and in many cases, even sex trafficking. Um, I, the, in this case, I'd say sexual assault. In Eva's case, in my opinion, it's sexual assault because you know she didn't have an opportunity to say no it sounded like before the job, she was, her agent kept work away from her. So she was poor and needed, um, needed the work. So she wasn't in any position to say no to anything. And then once the scene happened, you know, she just had to get through it. Um, it during the scene, she's screaming out, like Woodman 
does a lot of theatre to make things look consensual. A lot of the bad people in porn, they do a lot of elaborate videos to show that everything's okay. Like what? Um, like just talking to the girls at the beginning, saying, okay, it's going to be a rough scene, but you know, you can say no, we'll stop. But obviously what they don't show is the conditioning that happens with the agent. So with the agent, all the Russian girls are told, um, you know, to be successful in this industry, you can't say no, you can't say stop. You're a Slavic girl. Slavic girls are strong performers. We don't quit. We, so like they try and make it like a point of pride for them to never say no. They say, you know, you don't want to be like the European girls. They're so weak. They say no and they're so fussy. And can you imagine like that? And this is in a systematic way. But see if he's saying that at the start, this is going to be rough. You can say no. Is that not him covered then? That's not consent. Consent, like it, it, no. But do you his... know what I mean? If he's saying it's a, if he's saying, well, I says it was a violent scene and it was violent. Can they not? He not say then it was all made up for the cameras and this and that. Is, exactly. Is I think that I think there's some manipulation of that. there where he says, well, I've got that covered. Well, that's manipulation for the people who audit him, like Visa and Mastercard, because they they audit the internet. They control what porn is allowed and what porn's not. And if you're not contrained in consent, if you don't understand consent fully, and these are financial institutions. Do they sign anything before they do it? You sign a model release. Um, I don't know if he uses consent forms currently, but in porn, generally a consent form is a positive acknowledgement of I want to do this. But with Woodman, nothing can be consensual. And the reason for that is because they're not given a choice in an environment where they can say no. So you imagine there's you, there's your agent sat there who can send you home at any time because you're an illegal immigrant. And they're saying, we're going to do this, 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 this. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. You, you don't, you're not given a reason. You can't even... A lot of times when girls say no in porn, they'll be like, oh, I'm sick, you know? So they... they they go like not go to that shoe. Oh, I can't make that date. I've got a I've got a job or whatever. But when you're there on the day, the girl doesn't have a way out. And especially these very vulnerable girls who are working illegally, like there's nothing in that. It's a deliberate process. He could say to the girl weeks in advance, "I want a gangbang with four guys. It will be me as well." Remember, he's a very old, fat, ugly, hairy man. Most girls don't want to have sex with him. They'll prefer a different performer. But, you know, on the day, he, it's hard to say no to him. How do you say no to someone who can damage your career? How do you say no to someone with the, who's, who you're told is the most famous producer in Budapest, the biggest producer? It's, it's, a very, it's a deliberate situation where girls cannot say no. Very few girls say no. The ones that do tend to be the girls that start a little bit older. Uh, you know, like girls like 24, 25, they've got a little bit of experience dealing with men and have maybe been in some, had some life experience before and they can handle that situation. What should be put in place to protect the women? First, we need to be checking work permits. Um, like I say, it's... It just seems such a big industry to stop by what permits because I, that would help with um the russian girls I, I i've made a kind of like draft manifesto and for me it's giving girls the right to withdraw consent from the video after production so let's say a model comes for a shoot and she signs the model release i think for porn she should be given a month to say you know what I'm not going to let you use that scene. And I think that would improve the industry so much because it shifts the power back onto the model. Because every producer will be treating models so well. You know, do you want drinks? What do you want? Let's take you for food. You know, is this okay? Which guy do you want to work with today? Because, you know, you don't want to spend money on a scene and then the girls say, no, you can't use that. So that for me, I think it would take something really extreme like that to make all porn safe. Is there any good size in the porn industry? So many. Um, like I say, the, the camaraderie is amazing. I, I think especially with the girls, a lot of, I think there's a lot of broken people in the porn industry. Um, you know, like my, myself, I, have, I was a problem drinker. Um, when you're doing something like that, you kind, 
you kind of destroy a lot of the close relationships in your life. Um, and I think porn kind of is like a family for people that are maybe not so close to their family. What made you turn to drink? I think it was social anxiety. Just I was, it was really awkward. And so to feel comfortable, I was drinking a lot. So uh, it's a, it is a low vibrational kind of business. I've interviewed enough people and I'm not daft enough. I'm very aware of when I see things. And like I said earlier, I've got friends in the porn industry who I love to bits. It's their mm -hmm. choices. I've got friends in the who do OnlyFans, male and female, who I love to bits. It's their choice. It's not my choice. I would never have my daughter doing it or my son doing it. Mm -hmm. I would never settle down with anybody in that industry either. But that's their choices and I don't hate them for it. Do yeah, you know what I mean, if they're happy, which I, again, I don't know if they ever truly are, but some of them are so in denial as well. And I can see that. And I would never say, well, you're doing this wrong because it's their choices at that time. Whatever's serving them in that moment of life, that's what they've chose. And it's not me to say because I've made many wrong choices and many mm -hmm. decisions that people were against. I still fucking done them. So for me, it's just as long as you're not harming anyone. But when you're speaking about these men, these cunts deserve to be fucking strung up and, and put away because if they're putting scenes out there that's rape and abuse then how's it not been took down why haven't they been charged i mean this is a big question um i was speaking to a journalist today just about the situation in the uk with rape and police forces generally are not believing victims most rapes are not even reported when they are they're not being followed up uh the cps is letting people down um, and this is in the UK. So imagine what it's like in Hungary, a, a country where they don't have woke politics. It's very conservative. There isn't a female rights movement. Um, it, it's like, for example, every girl I know in Budapest has been groped on public transport uh, or in bars because it is normal there. It's not acceptable, but you know, it, it, porn is really low down on the priorities list. And um, uh, I heard, I've heard examples of cases against sex workers being the rapist being found innocent because she's a sex worker, like by judges. They don't even have trial by jury in Hungary. It's a judge that decides. Um, so it, it's, there's people that are fighting to change things. I'm now speaking with charities there, um, made connections um, with the authorities as well. All I can do is give them the information I have, but I hope some action is taken. But I think the sad truth is that when communism ended, Eastern Europe became a hotbed of exploitation. Uh, Romanian girls, Russian girls, Ukrainian girls, even Hungarian girls, they're the most trafficked in the world. Um, the scale of sex trafficking, either through manipulation or uh, through force in some cases, especially in Russia, it's off the charts. And often they're trafficked into legal businesses like porn or German brothels. Sex, the traffic, human trafficking industry is bigger than the drug industry now. With harvesting, oh, really? harvesting their, their body parts, prostitution, it's just, it's, it's a trillion dollar industry. It's mm -hmm. fucking scary. And it's not just a few thousand, it's millions of people going missing every year. Mm -hmm. And with the selling of the heart, the liver, the kidneys, and then I'm taking them to prostitution and everything. It's dark, the world. And I always like to try and see the benefits and the positives of life. But because I interview enough people, man, it makes me think, fuck me, how dark is this I place? I've had a really positive experience in the I don't regret doing it. I think Do you still do it? No, I I tried, but I just I don't think I can. Yeah, yeah. for just, me personally looking from the outside, if you've done it, then you're not different. No matter how clean cut it is, that you're still in yeah. that industry. For me, I just feel that I have taken part in some horrible things, not knowingly. But I don't think that makes it right, you know? And I just feel like there's so many really great young up and coming productions. I think we need a clear out. Companies like Gamma Entertainment, um, they, they, they don't deserve to exist. You know, they've been monetizing rape videos. The, their employees contacted me 
and they told me that they um that people at the company they signed a letter complaining about Rocco Zafredi's videos and the company said oh no you've been too too sensitive and they told me that as editors they were asked to edit out anything that looks rapey anything that looks too rapey so they knew about all this they've been hiding um they've they they were hosting his videos on a website called Adult Time, which is like Pornhub, but you pay for it. It's like their biggest website. And to protect Rocco, instead of just cancelling him, like that's all I wanted, was just to apologize to the girls. I thought they'd do the right thing. You know, fire him, cut off his money, uh, stop him producing. They set him up on their own domain, so now you have to get his videos from his own website because they think they know he's high risk. And when Pornhub were hosting, were courts hosting underage porn and rape porn. And remember Pornhub, like they weren't doing the crime. They were just like Facebook or Twitter. They were just hosting the videos. Like Pornhub weren't making rape porn. They weren't making money deliberately from rape videos. They were just managing the site badly. But Gamma Entertainment, they're knowingly selling rape videos. And what happened to um, MindGeek is, like to Pornhub, they lost Visa and MasterCard. Visa and MasterCard said, no, you can't process with us anymore. But when I told Visa and MasterCard about Rocco, there seems to be some collusion between either the merchant banks, Visa and MasterCard, or Visa and MasterCard, and the company Gamma Entertainment. And they've allowed Gamma to cover up their tracks. They've deleted 2,000 of the videos from his website um, and they're just pretending, you know, all those rape videos don't exist. How much does Pornhub make? Not much, only about 400 million a year. But you say not much, it's still a lot. In media, it's small. It's like, you know, one TV channel. Mm. It's like the whole, all of their properties, like 400 million. It's not even like... um, How much does these top porn stars make, these men? Men don't make much, you know, men are charging, you know, maybe 200 to 400 euros per scene. And then on their OnlyFans, they don't make much money either, um, unless they can appeal to gay fans. Um, but women, huge money now, like footballer money, but not in Europe. OnlyFans, some of the girls are making six figures. Huge, isn't that? But I know a lot of the men who are gay for pay just sucking dick for money. Mm-hmm. I think that crazy as well, but people do whatever it is to survive in this world. For me, is there's plenty of other options, but yeah, just... yeah, that'd be a step too far for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated by the topic, though. It's just yeah. Listen, I'm fascinated by all topics. I'm yeah. just interested in stories and why people do what they're doing, how they get involved. You've been in the porn industry to then try to shed light on the sex cases in it and hmm. try to find more protection. By all means, listen, sex sells. It's one of the biggest things on the planet. Yeah. The reason why people do OnlyFans because majority of people are perverts. They want to pay for it. So, and, and a lot of people, listen, a lot of men are lonely. One third of men are virgins. So, you know, you've been mm. that geeky guy where you've yeah, went yeah. without sex and shit. So people are just want to feel a connection and interact with a female. They're giving them attention, FaceTime. Yes, they're bleeding them for their money, but it makes them feel a little part of something. So that is a big commodity where people mm. are making money. We get it, but there needs to be more protection and more understanding. Well, wait a minute. Asking the right questions and signing forms to say, well, if I don't like that scene, I need that took out. I didn't want to do that scene. So mm-hmm. I can go to the police. Look, where's my protection? So how do you then, with the stuff that you're doing, what's the outcome you want to try and get put in place? Honestly, my my goal is just really small. I guess, you know, I live in Budapest. Officially, I live in Budapest. I've kind of left now. But... Were you feeling threatened? Um, I, I did receive threats. Um, From who? Um, a lot of, like, you know, some of them were like silly, like uh, Pierre Woodman would like look up my business details, send me my address and say, oh, I know where you live, you know. And it's like, it's silly, but um, obviously my my mum was worried more than me, you know, so she preferred me to be somewhere else just for my own safety. Uh, and also a charity I was working with as I was informing them of what's happening, they were concerned. So I just, I just followed their advice, you know. Um, yeah, listen, it's not 
these ain't small charges. These yeah. are charges that nobody wants to ever be charged with. Yeah. And these guys will do whatever it wants to take their career. Clearly, I don't know all the ins and outs of them. I don't know these people, but if they're if you're saying what they're doing in these scenes is that's wrong in a million and they deserve to get what's fucking coming to them, mm. no matter if it's porn or not. But because it's in that industry, people will think they'll turn their blind eye. Yeah, this seems to be the thing. When I post things on TikTok, guys say, um, yeah, but they got paid or they accepted the money, didn't they? As if like... That makes it okay. Yeah. Like, so they accepted the money, so it's okay. So or you go, and, um, you go and rape a prostitute at four or 50 fucking quid. Yeah. Yeah, but you took the money. Yeah. Um, they say, uh, oh, but she did another scene for him in the future. And that one's more difficult to, to understand, right? But that, uh, again... You can still see where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Going back, going back, it kind of just, it it takes away, if it ever does go to court, that's, they would just say, well, she came back. If she was that threatened, why did she come back? Yeah. That's the way I would see it as well. Well, well, this is what happens. You understand that? Yeah. Well, this is what happens with abusive relationships and they call it trauma bonding. Um, You know, like say, or and with pimps as well, like say a pimp threatens your life and says, I'm going to shoot you but then says, but I'm not going to because I care about you. Like that, you're thankful they didn't kill you. Yeah, of course, trauma bond in Stockholm it's, syndrome. Um, love, yeah, in love, Stockholm love syndrome. Bomb and- so a lot of girls don't realise they're being abused until maybe, I think most all of them realise in the end, but it can take some time, you know. Mm-hmm. And I mean, some of some of the unsavoury characters in this are ridiculous, like, um, like, Real Babes, one of the agents that supplies girls to Woodman uh, and Rocco. Like, they're, they're just such obviously bad people. Like, like having an escort agency in Hungary is illegal. But like, I've got proof that they're sending girls to escort clients, but not telling them it's an escort client. So they're, it's prostitution, but with no condoms. And the guy's just told to, you know, have a camera or film on his phone. And they get angry if a girl asks questions. Like another one of the unsavory characters, like, like the is uh, this guy in Belgium called Dennis Blackmagic. He's not really a porn producer. He did like a few porn videos, and he's like a reality TV star that kind of pretends he's in the porn industry in Belgium. He uses that for fame to get girls. Um, and this guy is convicted um, three times of sexual offenses against children including raping a 15 year old girl and like pierre woodman is the only person in the industry that works with him like no one else would recruit girls through someone that's a convicted rapist because how do you know they're not trafficked how do you know yeah and that too oh no pierre woodman says um oh but 15 is nearly an adult so it's okay and it's like this is the mentality i'm dealing with and it's so hard to believe that these characters could exist in the professional porn industry, but they do. And like my goal really is just to stop this narrow group of people. I don't have any illusion that, um, you know, it's a small podcast I have. Um, like I just want to shine a light on these people and I'm hoping that you know, someone with more power than me can take the for- the story forward. Um, All you can do is just shed more light on it. Yeah, I'm These just going to keep, well. yeah, keep, keep talking. Yeah, keep talking and keep exposing the truth of what these fuckers are doing and, and mm-hmm. if everything you say is legit because people will say well you were in the porn industry you're bitter against them you're jealous against them you're going to get that sort of yeah backlash. yeah i mean i i took the decision i mean as i've done this story i've realized the bad things i've done um and i'm just being completely honest about it um you know i'll own my crimes if if i get punished for that like i deserve it but i think you know everyone in the european porn industry has a lot to answer for um and i'll take my punishment um if and when it comes do you I think, think you'll get punished for that it's a, i don't know I, I think i should i think there should be i don't know how accountable you are as an employer if you hire illegal immigrants knowingly i don't know i don't know what i don't know what the law is how much support have you got just now from the industry yeah um there's a lot of secret support 
Um, no one's public. Um, but you can understand that as well because you were the same a few years ago when you were yeah, scared. Yeah, I understand it. Like the people, I've lost a lot of friends through it, um, including some close friends. Um, partly, yeah, um, partly because they've been trying to turn friends against me. I suspect they even paid one close friend to turn against me. Um, you know, she had some money troubles. Um, she was like kind of not, not my co-host, but she was on most of my podcasts. Um, she started the investigation against Woodman. She was the person that put me onto the Eva stuff. And then she had some money trouble because, you know, you can't get a mortgage as an escort, right? So um, she needed like a 20 grand more as a loan or something. And um, she met Woodman for lunch. And uh, then suddenly she turned against started saying like just saying the opposite of everything she said before and supporting him publicly even though in private messages she said the worst things about him you know that she believes the allegations against him because you then coming at the forefront and try to expose the big names they will find dirt on you so if you've yeah. got any skeletons in your closet it will come out yeah well that's the thing that i'm a bit weird and i think because i had a female business partner i always you know, we both always did everything together and we made mistakes, sure, but I don't think we ever did, apart from the um, the sex trafficking thing, like benefiting from trafficked girls, but I don't think we did anything deliberately bad, you know? So I think they're finding it quite hard because they can't find any dirt on me. It's, um, it's quite weird for them, I think. I mean, most people are in control because most people in porn, especially the girls, are usually doing something a little bit wrong like escorting for example uh they'll escort in the uk where but they're not paying taxes in the uk so they'll threaten the girls oh we're going to report your escorting to the border force in england and like that's how they'll control them and get them to take down their comments so who had the traffic girls everybody oh um everybody really uh, everybody what, all the agents. company uh, agency was it just agencies Agents, yeah. Every, every every porn company uses trafficked girls. Every porn company. Not not one porn company doesn't. So why is that them. allowed then if it's so blatantly out there? I think just there's no like like um in, 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 in construction or farming, for example, like or like everybody's using some trafficked people, right? But like who's checking? You know, who's checking illegal immigrants' papers? It's different. Listen, it's very difficult. coming over from wherever and they're going and working a restaurant or a chip shop. But it's different if you're getting put out and you're making your own money to send back home. But is it different? That's what these girls are doing. Like they're, they're supporting their families and back sex home with is it. It's different, though. If they don't want to do sex, it's a totally different but, ball game. A lot of these people leave to find work to send money home. But if they're. If this they're, is what they're doing. But if they're there. These girls do support their families back home. Yeah, but if they're degree. there and it's the free will to be there, that's different. That's different. If they've got the free will, but if they've been forced, then it's different again. Uh, yeah, but with other jobs, people are also being forced, right? Yeah, anybody that's being yeah. forced is wrong. I'm talking about the people who's coming over to, because mm -hmm. they make back money here and they're illegal mm -hmm. and they just go into restaurants or working Indians or Chinese or... Whatever it is, they want to work any shop, any restaurant, yeah. and they're making a bit of money to send home, and they're, they're doing it from their own free will. Yeah, I don't get, I don't care, but no. if it's trafficked and you're getting trafficked to have sex and you don't want to do it, that's a different ball game. Well, that's well, some dark stuff. Well, this is the problem, and I think this is where we get into immigration policy because these conditions wouldn't exist if there were legal routes for people to come in. Right, the, we give the traffickers power by make it by creating illegal immigrants. And I mean, I, I'm, you know, having lived abroad for, you know, 10 years, um, I, I, I just think let everybody come in, work, pay taxes, like things will just balance out, you know, um, I'm, cause you know, I've been an immigrant, um, I spend a lot of time in Turkey and, you know, I see so many Iraqi, Afghan, um, Syrian refugees there. And they're just normal people doing their job, you know. Yeah, I don't and mind any, anybody like, that wants to come here and make a living and yeah. do the right thing. It's not causing any harm. They're not causing any destruction. By all means, do so because the British go everywhere around the world. Yeah, we've we're got everywhere. A fucking cheek, and, yeah. but there's a lot of good policies here for Britain. I know people say, "Oh, 
there's too many immigrants, but if they're willing to work and do whatever, then by all means, let them be. But yeah. it's the ones who are here are fucking raping kids and doing bad shit, then fuck them off. Yeah, like Kick let's... fuck out them and fuck them off. Yeah, let's put our resources into stopping criminals rather than, you know, making people that just want a job criminals, you know? And that's the thing in, in where I am, you know, these girls can't go to the police yeah. because, you know, they're, they're, they shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be working. Where do you go forward for the future with it all? Um, honestly, I, I've, it, in a weird way, it's been quite positive for me. I know it's like a horrible thing to say, but, you know, I, I lived like a very selfish life, especially I think anyone with some kind of addiction, they do, they do live a really selfish life. And, you know, it has been good to do something for other people instead. And so, you know, I'm hoping I can just keep doing the podcast, um, just try and put some good things into the world. Um, if I can, you know, if the next period of my life is a bit more positive, um, that's good for me. And I hope, I just hope that the things I've done make a difference because the worst is when, like people don't see the amount of work it takes to do these stories. Like I'm very lucky that I have an income from my old business and I was able to take four months, maybe five months out of my life to just focus on nothing but this. Like there's a lot of research, like talking to so many people, finding evidence, making sure you're watertight in your arguments so that they can't sue you for defamation. Um, it's hard. And you know, I'm lucky I was able to do that. It was difficult, the most difficult thing I've ever done. I just hope it makes a difference. Are you off the booze now? Oh, for three years, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's why you've kind of woken up a little bit where you've, your conscience has kicked in? Yeah, I worry, I wonder about this. I don't know. I, I don't know if you've ever had a period like that. From six years. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. From six years, drink drug free. But I wasn't fucking, I was just, I just loved partying. Yeah. I just loved it. I wasn't doing any fucking I hated it. Doing any, I, just, I hated it. I loved it at a time. Yeah. Listen, it eventually caught up with me when mm -hmm. I became more depressed, more upset, more angry towards life. That's no, I'm in a I good place, age. but do you feel that's you trying to cleanse your soul a bit with all the fucking dirt that you've done? I, I think, I think there's maybe an element of that. I, I don't know. I don't know if you found this, but um, like I'm not religious, but I found that religious stories helped me a lot when I was quitting drinking, and it, I don't know, it it, it has given me like something to. I don't know, like just some recognition that, you know, you can be a good person and, you know, being a good person takes a lot of effort and it's given me this, not need, but desire to just try and do good things and help people. And I guess you get meaning from your life in that way. Like my, my life had no meaning before, just money, parties, porn, food, travel, you know, just drunk most days mm -hmm. um very self just, but you know this you know seeing reality seeing yeah i guess that's what's happened is i see things as they really are now um have time to think mm -hmm. and if you don't like how reality looks i guess you try to change it a little bit i don't know it sounds quite egotistical what is your podcast for people to have a look at that because people are ah, being intrigued by this it's um called Lustcast. it's very small at the moment but um I guess kind of growing um and yeah it's just it's just sex relationship advice um whatever topics i'm interested in um but for me, mostly for straight men i'd say so for anybody watching it's maybe want to look into this more or maybe want to give you support what what would you say to them yeah i think um most important thing is you know like share your video like share just share the more people see it the more chance there is that someone that can do something will see it and it is definitely making a difference i'm in touch with um bigger charities bigger um more competent police officers because of speaking out and because of doing like a news show so yeah, just share anything you can if you want to know more there's i think there's 10 hours of very detailed content breaking things down step by step some things happened kind of you see the story as it just goes along, really. 
So it's, it's if you're really into detail and want to know the behind the scenes of how the porn industry really works, there's 10 hours of content there. Um, but it might be a bit boring for most people, but if you are really fascinated, then... Would you like to finish up on anything, anything that we missed to kind of freshen people's minds or what, how dark the industry can be? Um, I think, I don't, I think just, I don't like you said that how, um, you know, maybe it's not good even when people think it's good. And I guess I just challenged that a little bit. I think like porn, I, I've benefited from porn in so many ways. I think I learned about relationships. Okay. Maybe by making mistakes and your porn isn't a relationship, but you learn about communication. You know, it's a people business. And I think a lot of people in the porn industry learn about relationships that way. Um, it, you get so many positives from it. I've grown so much because of the incredible people I've met, uh, incredible people I've worked with, um, think amazing friends I've met along the way. Um, there's a really positive side. And the way I would liken it is more like, you know, when you kind of first, just like, I guess you experienced this before I did, um, when you get into sex and you, you know, you just have like a slutty phase, you know, you're trying to sleep with everybody. Um, porn's kind of like that, you know? And then when you grow up, you maybe pull back from it a bit. And, you know, you maybe do less extreme things. Maybe I think most OnlyFans girls are just having sex with their partner only. I mean, that's great. I think it's very healthy. Um, and the slutty phase can be healthy too, because maybe you need it. Maybe you need to test your boundaries. Maybe you need a bit of attention because you didn't have it before. So, you know, getting extreme attention can be quite therapeutic and build your confidence. Um, What's the worst thing you've seen in porn? Oh, the worst thing I've seen, I think suicides. That's, that's the worst. Because there are damaged souls in our business. There are vulnerable people in our business. And there's been some really good things to try and help them like there's um the industry funds support lines like there's pineapple support where sex workers can call if they need help but yeah male or female uh, it's surprising like there's it's just an industry that will attract damaged people any industry can but i think that's the thing is in porn i think we should be aware that we are attractive to vulnerable people so we have to be more cautious and more empathetic and more supportive to the employees than we would be in a normal business. Tommy, would you like to finish up on anything else? Um, I guess, I don't know. What do you think to porn addiction? I think it's bad for the soul, bad for the mind. You think it's real? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm coming to that conclusion. It grains the amygdala in the brain. Porn, watching porn makes you depressed. Oh, you think? Yeah, watching porn makes you depressed. Anybody that's watching porn is depressed. Also, if you're wanking and masturbating all the time, it is an energy. Then we can go down the route of soul ties and energy exchange. And mm. Sex is a powerful tool. No matter if people say it's porn, it's only porn. I'm doing it for the cameras. Entertainment's bullshit. Mm. You're still getting fucked. You're still passing on energies. You're still connecting. So porn is a depressant. The more you watch porn, the more you see people as objects. You don't see them as real. Your sex life will get worse. It won't improve. You won't learn new moves because you don't. There's no connection there. There's no love. There's mm. no connection to love a partner. You can f have the most fucking a kiss could be just as good as having sex if it's with the right person, the right connection, the right feel, the right touch. But the scientific the science is there for the depression in porn and how it darkens the mind and how it's negative towards society but it sells people are lonely people are think, scared do you think that's just porn or do you think it's say sexy photos on instagram too everything i don't uh, the sexy photos isn't as extreme but we see more photos in one day than our great grandfather seen their mm. whole lifetime we mm -hmm. see more sexual images so the mind is, but men, testosterone, it's a, it's a high sex drive that men have got. Is, that's our, our main fucking chemical. And 
the higher masses or whatever it is they're using it against you where you're so caught on Instagram if you look at people's followers and men are just following a lot of bikini girls I follow mm -hmm. a lot of beautiful girls yeah because because that's what I like to look at sometimes it's not it's just natural I know this but I still follow people and I go oh, she's beautiful she's mm -hmm. nice she looks fucking great yeah so that's that's me and I'm in a good place mm -hmm. so I, I listen I follow fucking men as well and I always like their photos if they're top I go oh, he's fucking great shape but I just feel as if the whole porn industry is it's not a positive for me personally it's not a positive thing for society it's not a positive thing for life it's not a mm. positive i wouldn't want my kids doing it i wouldn't want my kids involved in it but like i say i've got porn stars who are great friends and i love mm -hmm. them to bits and it's their choices i wouldn't talk them out at but if they ever came to me and need advice i would tell them the exact same stuff i'm telling you yeah i don't believe it's good for you i believe you're better than that i believe you're you're just caught up in a loop and a bad place to make money but you're yeah, yeah, selling your soul, and that's the way I see it. Listen, mm -hmm. I could be wrong. I could be a fucking porn star in five years. I might have OnlyFans next yeah, month. Yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you'd make but, a lot uh, of money. You just don't know. Do you know what I mean? I don't, that's, this is a life in the way I see the world now. Yeah, people are in the porn industry. It's the way they are now, and if they've been trafficked, then that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, people yeah. are making a conscious choice to do porn. Then that's down to them. They might be happy. I, I'm not. I don't live inside of them where I know the ins and outs. But for me, the science is there where it is a depressant. It's not good for the brain. It's not good for the mind. It's not good for your motivation. It's not good for your confidence. It dumbs you down in all aspects just mm. for a, a fucking release for 10, 20 seconds and you've, you, you'll naturally get your dopamine kick. But I don't know. What do you think about it now? It's, it's difficult because I'm coming from inside the industry. Yeah. And inside the industry... I've always been defensive to any criticism. Of course. So like Layla or Exodus Cry, I just thought they were set up to attack the porn industry. I didn't think they had a case, so I never investigated. With porn addiction, I always thought, bullshit. You know, it's just Christians attacking the porn industry. No, no. But um, You've got to stay open-minded. Yeah. You can't be in a field and, and then think it's just one-sided for you. You've got to look at all the mm. you've got to look at everything that's why i stay open-minded that's mm. why i can connect with so many different people because i could be wrong i'm not saying everybody stop wanking or stop mm. watching porn i'm just saying this is what i've learned i felt better if i'm not fucking masturbating every day if i've not watched mm. porn in years so i feel better and my life is going better when i eliminate things that i read up on and it was holding me back and that's, yeah. and it's just you start seeing the world differently and that's who you were then you, you stuck get, up for people and you get like a different kind of dopamine by delaying gratification don't yeah. you like self, with anything self-control self yeah, yeah which is so important especially coming off the booze or whatever self-control mm. gives you a new outlook in life you realize well, wait a minute i'm a lot stronger than what i am and then you can start eliminating other things mm. yeah it's the right. I, reason i ask is like i'm coming from inside the industry and my views on it are changing mm -hmm. but at the minute i've got to the stage where i think um porn can be healthy because like it is showing you new ideas it is inspiring you especially because it's so diverse it doesn't like the professional porn industry is a bit boring it's just all like you know girls getting aggressively fucked and come on the face at the end and it's like uh, i guess but there's such a spectrum and so many ways you can just engage your creativity and take that home with your partner if that's what interests you so i think that's good but yeah i do think too much of something can be bad i think if it's a surrogate for a relationship maybe it's bad um if you're doing it compulsively every day all day if you depend on it if you're missing a point you know if it is a, mm -hmm. you're becoming an addiction then yeah, it can be really bad. But girls whose boyfriends or partners watch porn are turned off by them who watch it mm. as well. So they're losing interest, they're losing connection, they lose something. So there's a lot. Listen, there's positives, don't yeah. get me wrong, but I'm ju that's just the way I'm seeing the world. Yeah. Like, so you're at that stage where I I'm kind of fresh you, and I'm just. You don't know yeah. it's fresh. And five years ago, you'd be thinking, no, the fucking porn industry is straight. You'd probably try to get me to do porn. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reassessing everything yeah, I thought I knew before. Stay open minded. Thing. Yeah. Don't stay blinded and guarded to what your life was because everybody's got opinions. Everybody sees it differently. Yeah. Go with your intuition. And, and if you can throw changes now and you can admit your fuck ups to the past, then um, it can only make you a better person i guess yeah honestly the whole experience has shaken everything i thought i knew so i'm just yeah. kind of you know the person i was it was like tommy mcdonald i was a porn producer that's how i introduced myself you know and now i'm like okay who am i like 
what do I believe? Because it, it is, you know, you've yeah. got to reassess things. Of course. It's, uh, Tommy, yeah. again, would you like to finish up on anything? No, <laughs> that was everything. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> God bless you and keep doing what you're doing. Um, hopefully you can get the answers and get results and protect more people on this planet and hopefully you get the support as well. Yeah. Take care, mate, and I look forward to seeing what you do. Yeah, thanks so much for having me because, yeah, like, it means a lot, really. Yeah, cheers, pal. Thanks.